welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum, where we discuss the issues that are coming up before us on town meeting day. And there's none more important than the schools. And presented the city budget in a good show. And this is going to be an equally good show because I have the president of the school board, uh, Jim Murphy, with me. Uh, nice now, the here. school board is formally called what? Uh, it's called the Board of School Commissioners. And our school, how many school commissioners do we have? We have nine, we have seven, we actually have, with the new merger, we've got a, an interesting setup. We have seven who represent Montpelier, and two who represent Roxbury, and to represent the, the weight of the, the votes in terms of proportionality by population. Each Montpelier commissioner has two votes, and each Roxbury member has one vote. Gosh, it sounds like the Constitution. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's 14 votes to two but seven members to two. Do we still have a student who, a have, student or two? We have two students, uh, and actually. Who are our two students? Uh, Emma, Emma Hartner and, um, and Hope Petrero, uh, and they're fantastic. They uh, present most meetings, uh, and they give the board updates on what's happening in the schools, and from the student's perspective, um, and actually the new superintendent has done a, a great job of making sure that they're meaningfully integrated and that we get feedback from them and they get the opportunity to tell us about what's going on. Now, since the last election, we've had a new superintendent. Yes. Would you discuss our new superintendent a little bit, please? Yeah, our new superintendent comes to us from Franklin Northwest where she was curriculum director. Uh, this is her first superintendency. Um, she brings a lot of energy, uh, a lot of great ideas. She's got a uh, very strong uh, educational foundation. Um, she's got good management skills. Uh, we're very excited about her and um, she's really doing, a, I think, a great job of looking uh, systematically at our schools. Are we getting the best, do, you know, do we have the right systems in place? Uh, are we getting the best out of our investments? Um, you know, where can we find, where can we find efficiencies? She's already actually found quite a bit of efficiencies. If you see our um, our reserve fund has actually increased greatly because she's managed to find a lot of money that that you know was that we could achieve savings on, um, and she's doing a great job, I think, of looking uh, to kind of really harness the great creativity and I think the the amazing assets we have from a personnel perspective, um, and make sure that we're doing the best to integrate you know the highest quality instructional uh, systems on that, and, and really giving us something to build on towards towards excellence and towards the the. Uh, the district's goals. What do we do with the reserve fund? I know in the past we've used it when the when the ballot yeah. issue went down, we supplemented with the reserve fund in order to keep the tax increase lower. What else do you do with the reserve fund? Yeah, the reserve fund, um, it's, it's a requirement actually of our policy that we keep, uh, I think, 2 or 2.5 percent um, of our total budget in reserve. Or, and uh, it's basically a rainy day fund, uh, you know, if we need to make some sort of uh, an unanticipated investment, um, an unanticipated expense, an unanticipated hire, uh, it's there. Uh, and it also gives some ability to, uh, you know, do some things during the school year that maybe weren't budgeted. While we're just talking general board before we get into yeah. the budget, I know that the community is concerned about safety at our schools. Yes. Would you just discuss measures that the board has been discussing about increasing protection of our kids or just basic safety at our schools? Uh, I know that must be a topic that's under It discussion. is a topic. It's actually a topic we just had at our last board meeting. Um, and we've actually made a fair amount of changes, probably most of which are not super noticeable um, you know, since Libby has come on. Uh, for one, we finally established a, a safety committee, uh, you know, a, a group that works with the administration to make sure that we're in compliance and doing everything we need to do. Uh, we've, we've definitely done a good job of making sure that the entrances and egresses at our school are safe. That both you buzz your way in. The, well, you both, but you buzz your way in and also just, you know, for instance, there were little things like there were some uh, rooms, particularly at the high school, where there were furniture and other items blocking exits. So making sure that, that you know, the entrances are secure and the exits are accessible, so if people need to get out quickly, uh, that can be done. Um, 
communication between the schools. Uh, until this year, if the, if the school communication system went down, um, other than cell phones, which you know, now we have Roxbury, Roxbury doesn't even have cell phone service, uh, there wasn't necessarily a way to communicate between buildings. And now we have a backup system where all four schools can talk to each other um, through that backup system if need be. Uh, we have a security officer that we work with the police station. Um, as well as the cop in the school. That is the, the cop in the school. Um, yeah, who, who helps oversee safety. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of measures like that, you know, ensuring that our, our teachers are, are well trained to, uh, you know, so they know what to do in, in various situations. Um, and, and things like, you know, we now have bleed kits and defibrillators in all the schools, uh, which we didn't before, and as tough as it is to talk about, you know, a, a bleed kit in a... What is know, a bleed kit? A bleed kit is, is basically a kit that allows um, quick application of a tourniquet to stop bleeding. So and there's staff that's trained to use those? And the staff that's trained to use those. Um, so if you have a situation like, you know, some of the magic, tragic situations we've had, one of the things they've actually found is that a lot of the deaths were caused by bleeding and, you know, people were not able to quickly stop bleeding and move to the uh, next, you know, the next victim. Um, a bleed kit allows you to do that. So, you know, things like that is tougher to think about, you know, those have been put in place just in the last you know, six to, to nine months. Has the board had any discussion whatsoever of arming teachers as others, other boards across the country are starting uh, to discuss? I, I, think with, I think that's a non-starter with our board. I, I think you know, teachers are not cops. Um, the data shows that that, you know, to be able to, um, you know, the type of training it takes to, to be able to effectively come into a situation and and handle it professionally handle it professionally without causing more harm uh, is something that you know that <laughs> military and, and police know how to do and it takes it takes a lot of training it's not putting you know it's not a a, a half day and, and putting a, a gun in a teacher's drawer and, and frankly the more guns you have around the more gun violence and the, you know, the more accidents you have. So I, I think that's a complete non-starter at our school. One, one conversation that I would like the board to have uh, is how much we involve our students in training and, and at, at what level. I mean, I do have a concern about, um, you know, particularly at, at kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Um, yeah, do we, do we need to impose worries on, on kids that, that may be hard for them to process. Roxbury, yes. what's the status of the merger right now? You guys have spent an entire year figuring out who gets two votes, who gets one yes. vote, who gets what, what, you know. How is that playing out right now? I think by and large it's playing out, it's playing out well. Uh, you know, it's, um, you know, we, we still don't have uh, full integration from uh, you know, Roxbury into our schools. We still have, you know, some students who have been grandfathered in. Uh, so About how many are there in, in terms of being grandfathered in? Uh, roughly? roughly um, A handful? It's... I, I would, I, I'd, I'd be guessing. I mean, it's, it's, you know, five or six grades at, you know, I think 20 to to 30 kids a grade. So oh, okay, so it's a significant number. It's a significant number. And That's grandfathered in means that they're going to other high schools other than Montpelier High School. Exactly, they're going, they're continuing at the high school they were at. This is the first year where, you know, the middle school students um, are coming in. So we've got a middle school class coming in. Uh, we also, and one of the reasons that, another reason the reserve fund went up is that we had actually budgeted uh, for, um, considerably more tuition expense than has anticipated. We've had a few students who've gone, who have, who have chosen to go to Montpelier High School. Uh, we also have some, some Roxbury students who um, ended up not being tuitioned for various reasons, such as they had actually moved out of Roxbury. Um, there were a few students who were in, in two, two household families, uh, you know, 
Right. One one parent was in Roxbury. One parent was in say you know Northfield. Yeah, Northfield or Berlin, and they were able to establish residence with with the second parent for for their high school education. Now in 2018 and 19, you had 31 students in Roxbury. Yep. In that school. Yeah. Of which about four were in second grade. Yes. Is that sustainable? Uh, yeah, right now the, the finances work and you know, as part of the merger, we've committed to, uh, you know, f to keeping that school open for the next four years. Uh, I think that's that school is an important anchor in that community, and I know it's very important to the members of Roxbury to have a vibrant school in that community. I think we're probably going to have to have discussions over time about what that school looks After like. After four years, will that school close, or is that up to discussion? Uh, there are certainly no plans to close that school after four years, but I think if, if, if we want that school to be viable long term and possibly, it, it might possibly be viable in its current form, but I think that's a discussion we need to start having relatively soon about, you know, what we want that school to look like. Because it's, it's, there are ways to keep it viable long term. Um, we, we might have to think about what, what the model is for that though, because small schools are, are difficult to keep open, although right now financially it does work. What is the length of the bus trip for school kids coming in to the middle school from? It's about Oxford? half an hour. So it's a half an hour? Yeah, maybe a little longer. Does the half an hour bus trip affect the number of snow days? Uh, it, it does not. For I'm, the entire district? Um, my understanding is that for the snow days we've had this year, you know, we've had an incredibly snowy winter. Um, that Roxbury was not the cause of an actual snow day. Uh, it, I think it was the cause of perhaps one or two slow, de slow starts, um, delayed starts. Uh, yeah, Olivia, the superintendent, she checks with both road crews in both towns, uh, you know, starting the night before, you know, picking up again at, you know, like four in the morning. Uh, you know, I, I think that those towns have, have different expectations. I mean, Roxbury, they're, they're rural, they understand that um, you know, they, they can't get everything cleared and that sometimes they're, you know, they, they deal with it. Uh, but this year, the, you know, the snow days have been the result of just Genuine a lot weather. of snow. Yeah. Uh, let's go into a budget summary. Let's go yes. into the budget. I know we do this every year. You guys yep. who are following this show year by year by year know that I always say, it's impossible to exactly predict what the budget will be now because the legislature has to establish what. Why is it impossible to estimate the budget? You've been with the budget process for years. Yeah, I mean, the, the budget is, is a, a marriage between, uh, you know, a state allocation of funds and then local funds. Um, getting the exact numbers both on what the state yield is, what the state will give us, uh, and then also what's called the common level of appraisal, which is an adjustment to... Uh, How often we appraise. Yeah, basically to the, the appraisal rates. They'll right. go into a town and say, well, does this really reflect what the property values are? Right. And then they'll do a percentage adjustment. Um, you know, those two numbers, uh, as well as the number of what's called equalized pupils, which is roughly equivalent to the number of pupils we have, but... Um, it, it goes through a formula that's weighted, so it, it's not exact. Those numbers all have to be approved by the legislature. That oftentimes happens, in fact, for a few of those numbers, it, it definitely happens after, um, after the actual budgets are voted on. So the numbers we go into are essentially the Agency of Education's best guess at what those numbers will be. They tend not to vary hugely between what AOE gives us during the budgeting process and what the legislature ends up um, approving. Uh, they can vary some, and actually, you know, I think the last two years we've, we've been lucky. The, the numbers have actually been adjusted and finalized in our favor. Um, this year we'll, we'll see. <laughs> that doesn't sound <laughs> promising. Well, we just, you just don't know. I don't, I don't want to make any promises, but the last two years have been, have been um, when I, Ann appeared talking about the Ann Watson appeared yeah. uh, talking about the city budget, she said that they lucked out this year in terms of health contributions, and that helped to keep the city budget yeah. at a more manageable rate. How did you guys do? Uh, 
A little mixed, uh, you know, the, the percentage increase from our, our provider uh, has gone up, you know, it, it goes up as it typically does well above inflationary rates, so I think 11.8%. Oh. Um, How did that compare with last year? <sighs> Any I think idea? Last year was similar. Last year was okay. another, you know. So we budgeted in, we budgeted in that a in. sense, yeah. towards that high figure. Yeah. Um, we have, we, yeah, last year we, we readjusted the way that we provide health care. Right now, we, for, um, for expenses, for kind of out of pocket expenses, we've got a health reimbursement account that, that, basically makes up what two years ago um, teachers used to get without, and employees used to get without having to make that contribution. So um, that's kind of a, a s vaguely a slush fund. Um, the, the way that, that some employees have, have set up that fund has, has created some savings there. So we've had some, some small savings um, from our health reimbursement account uh, matched with another you know, relatively steep increase. Now, if you're looking at the budget summary on the screen, which I assume you are, 2.7% uh, increase this year. Yes. And in FY19, it was 8%. Yeah. Why? What, what's the difference? Uh, for one, I, yeah, we... Besides I, roughly 5.5%. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I think the last uh, couple years... Um, you know, given the fact that we've had growing enrollment and uh, we had a few years of cuts, yeah, I think we made some some increases that kind of backfilled in some some places where there were were cutbacks. Uh, I also think it was uh, intentionally uh, conservative, as as I said. You know, we've got a new administration. Um, you know, the superintendent really wants to see what we have now, uh, see what we have that's working. Uh, what's not working, um, and then kind of do a system overlay and, and see where strategically the investments make the most sense. So, um, you know, she hasn't had time to fully do that. So, uh, you know, a lot of the, the budget, I think, reflects, um, I don't want to say status quo, because I think there are some, some things in there where, where there have been some steps forward. But uh, this was not a year to really come in and make investments. Because where we are we in the teachers' contract? Uh, we're in negotiations again. Oh, okay. Yeah. So possibly next year might reflect a new teachers' contract. Yes. Or will reflect a new teachers' uh, contract. Yeah, there will be a new teachers' contract for next year, and then we'll be in negotiations again for um, a two-year budget. And also, yeah, next year is when the the state will start taking over the health care. So that will that will change things as well. How do how do you think it will change things? Uh, How are they projecting that it will change things? Um, will the larger grouping result possibly in a reduction of cost to the districts? I think there's. I think that's. That's the, the hope. That's, that's the, the hope. aspiration. That's the hope. Whether that that happens or not is a question. Um, it will certainly, I think, simplify the negotiations. Um, you know, because healthcare obviously plays a substantial role in terms of. Um, you know, overall compensation. Uh, so it will, the negotiations around compensation will, will not include those. Um, so, so we'll see. I mean, the, the hope is that it continues the same level of quality coverage that our employees get now, plus, um, yeah, plus savings and, and just having it be a, a larger pool. In terms of our enrollment, uh, this is now on the screen as our enrollment projection. And you'll see that in 2017-18, um, we were at 1,053, and then we went up to 1,072. Yep. And it's projected next year that we'll actually pick up 60-some-odd new students and bring it up to 1,163. Um, what does that mean in the increase in education spending? Does, does that mean... When we increase education spending 4%, and last year you said that we were yeah. backfilling to get 6.5%, what are we spending that on? What's the additional 4%? Is it additional staff? Uh, uh, yeah, some of it's just you know, increases in ex expenditure. I mean, we have, added, we have added staff. Most of it is additions of staff, and then 
you know, increases in, you know, in, in teacher pay, et cetera. Um, yeah, some of it goes to, you know, to facilities, administration, et cetera, but um, yeah, for now, the last few years, we've, we've definitely added some, some positions. And now we're putting in a human resources coordinator. Yes. And that's in the superintendent's office. Yes. And that boosted spending in the superintendent's office by 25%. What is the human resources coordinator going to do that we haven't done before because we've always had human resources to coordinate? Uh, basically, we are just barely keeping head above water in terms of, of human resources. And, and with a yeah, with an organization that's 25 or 24 million dollars has over 200 employees, there's a lot of human resources issues. Um, right now we're doing it very ad hoc. Uh, yeah, I think there's worries about whether we're actually doing everything we need to do. Um, so it's, it's not a particularly um, dazzling addition, but it's, it's very necessary and it's been talked about for a while as, as we need someone who, who can have you know, who can make sure that, you know, people who have complaints are getting their complaints properly filed, that, for, you know, all the forms that need to get done are getting done, that, you know, that, that health claims, et cetera, are getting processed. So there's, there's a lot of work to do, and right now it's... Um, it's being shared. It's being shared, and it's, and it's additional for staff that are already... Um, yeah, taxed. <laughs> that are already taxed, and it, it's it's not being very well well coordinated, um, and yeah, the, the word I heard is is that you know we're kind of one or two complicated human resource problems away from a complete disaster in terms of just not being able to get stuff done. Now I'm not going to slow the the presentation down to explaining what the complete disaster is. I'll wait for it to yeah. happen, and then we'll discuss it next. Well, year. it just could be a <laughs> you know a, a complicated healthcare issue um, or. What about, uh, now when I get into jargon like this, please help us all. The social emotional learning coordinator at Union Elementary School. What is the social emotional learning coordinator doing? Is it behavioral it's issues? It's behavioral, it's, it's so allowing. Are we, are we restructuring again how we deal with behavior at Union Elementary? I think we're just adding resources there to make sure that, that kids who have um, you know, difficult behavioral challenges that require um, that require a level of of training that that um, is is pretty specialized um, that they're getting the attention they need so both you know they're able to to function and get the resources they need and also they they're not becoming distractions for you know, for other kids learning experiences and for, you know, for teachers. Without opening up a contentious issue, yes. will that person also be at Roxbury occasionally to help those elementary school kids? Um, I don't think the plan right now, uh, I, I think they may be doing some coordination at Roxbury, but I think the plan is largely to have it be UES focused. Um, special needs, any yes. changes in special needs um, this year? Uh, in the, the way that we address special needs, the way we do assessments or those type of things. Has that come before the board? Uh, somewhat nothing, there's nothing huge in the budget. Uh, as you know, the state has passed um, Act 173. Uh, you which, assume I know that. <laughs> yes, uh, which is changing the way that um, we fund special education. Uh, How does it change it? It basically gives districts a lot more flexibility to um, kind of meet various needs at various levels um, and takes away some of the kind of boxes that, that, that educators used to be in where you know, if a kid has X, Y, and Z issue that they can't get help from, from special educators. Um, and now it's doing, doing things where there's, there's kind of more intervention along the way. The idea is to um, to integrate coordination between general and special education and make sure that, you know, kids, kids get more intervention at more points that avoids larger problems. Because right now, you know, we allow problems to build up and if, if, you know, basically if you're not. It's like preventative maintenance. Yeah, if, if, you, if you know, 
in, until you know problems become huge, they sometimes don't get the attention they need, and this allows problems to be or issues to be um, addressed in more creative ways and more flexible ways earlier, which you know benefits kids. Is the state's share? Ratio still the same? Will that be a, the same in the future as to what percent of special needs the state will share? I believe I believe the the funding numbers do not change much. I think the way that they can be allocated and used does change. Uh, there's for a long time there's been a gap uh, in achievement testing yes. for various kinds of kids, and I'm not I'm not picking on the special needs kids, yeah. but there's a lot of different subsections that aren't doing as well yep. as uh, the modal. Um, Montpelier students. What I know the board is talking about that yeah. every year. Any new initiatives on that, or any feelings that the board has? Yeah, it's it's a it's a huge priority for the board. It's a huge priority for the uh, administration. I mean, we have made some investments over the last couple of years in terms of of literacy and math interventionists to you know to help kids that um, uh, that 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 do have challenges and that are um, you know, not uh, not keeping up with with their classmates and are, are struggling in ways. Um, it's a high priority of mine, and I think it's a high priority of the board. And I think it's one of the things we're going to ask of the administration now that they've had some time to to look at what they've got. Uh, that we really put in place a a vision and a plan for closing that gap because we've talked about it for a while, and I'd really like to see. Next year's budget and you know the budget after that um, be based on a, a plan to get us to the point where we're really making progress on the achievement gap because I I think it's gotten more lip service than progress over the last several years and I, I would like to reverse that. Can I flip to the other side of the bell curve? Yes. What about um, special and gifted kids, and and advanced placement and beyond advanced yeah. placement? What is going on in our district in that? Anything different? Uh, are we adding advanced placement? Are we holding on to our advanced we placement? We are. We're holding on to our advanced placement. I think it's very valued by uh, by the board. Uh, I think it's uh, very by the district. Um, we haven't had as robust a discussion about that as we have about equity because, like, frankly, it's not as it's not squeaking. It's not squeaking as much, and you know, we. Um, yeah, and, and I think in some ways the the, the move towards personalized learning. Uh, what is the move towards personalized learning? Well, it's it's given kids more um, more flexible pathways to to do creative things on their own. Um, you know, for instance, to to do an, an internship uh, at a business or are you talking about Matt McLean's community? Uh, yeah, exactly those type connection? of those type of things. Um, I think it benefited all students. Um, so, you know, we've we've done some moves in that direction that I think have have opened opened options and given, you know, gifted kids the ability to go out and um, spread their wings, spread their wings, and work with gifted com people in the community who can who can really teach them things that they're not learning in the classroom and then get, you know, get guidance. So. Uh, yeah, I think those have been steps in the right direction, but I think we need to continue to, you know, offer, offer the the classes we do and look for ways to, to expand them. What about career uh, people who are going into vocational tech? We've traditionally had very low yes. enrollments in vo-tech, but we have a number of kids who don't go to college, yeah. don't go to the military, and 12th grade is the terminal for them. Yeah. Is the district looking at career um, education in any way? They're definitely looking at it. I mean, I know that we are, um, you know, part of the, uh, you know, the effort to, you know, to, to send kids to vocational tech in, in Barrie and, you know, continue to support that. I, I agree. It's, it's something that, you know, it's a priority of the district. Um, and, and, you know, the administration definitely is looking at it and there are pathways, but I think it's something that we could could look at more. Maximizing every kid's yeah, potential. exactly. In terms of there's additional money in for food service. What's going on with our food service? Uh, we want to continue to, both two things, continue to provide quality and nutritious food to the students. 
Um, we also wanted to uh, improve uh, uh, the, 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 the quality of um, compensation and benefits that we gave to our food service employees. Um, they were not paid very well and did not have great benefits, and we've done some things to, um, to, to make that better and fairer. Are we making the connection between our food service and recycling? Uh, I know that we recycle and compost. Um, okay, in so it is going on. It is going on. Um, how how much education is going around it? I'm I'm not sure, but it's 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 part of the way that the cafeterias operate. We're working on building our capacity in world language, and equity. Yes. Would you explain what world language and equity actually mean? Uh, yeah, equity. I think is in this context. In this context. Um, you know, equity, you know, the biggest investment right now, I think, is the social emotional behavior. Um, you know, the way that we're using some of our federal grants, uh, you know, the administration, I think, is, is looking at making sure that we use them in ways that, that are maximize those grants um, and benefit all kids, uh, and especially kids who, you know, with that achievement gap in mind. Uh, and, you know, and then we've, yeah, you know, the intent is obviously to, to build on that. Uh, you know, in terms of of world language, um, we have commissioned a study, and a couple of schools in Chittenden County have gone down this road of doing to you know. There's been a big community discussion, a big community desire to have some sort of of world language, which don't we already have world languages in the middle school and the high school? We do have world languages in the middle and the high school, but the research shows that the twelve-year-old brain um, doesn't absorb it as well or in the same way as the five or six-year-old brain. Could we also then be talking about bringing? dance into the schools? Could we be talking about, you know, the things that parents are subsidizing right now yeah. for their younger children, uh, including language. Yes. Is that a move to move from the parents subsidizing it to the taxpayer subsidizing it? Well, I'm not. Um, Piano lessons is a perfect example. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's, there's not, uh, I think there's a bit of apples and oranges there. I mean, I think one of the reasons there's a desire for world languages as we have an increasingly connected and um, you know, smaller world in terms of cultures coming together. Uh, being monolingual is, is... But again, we already offer six years of language instruction, don't we? We offer six years of language instruction, but how effective is that? I mean, I took my six years of Spanish and I'm... Well, if you had taken it more seriously, Jim, Things would be different. <laughs> yeah, but you get in, you know, in, in, in places where people, there are very, f you know, the data suggests that the earlier you, two things, the earlier you introduce a second language, um, the, both the more effective it is at, at that, that child becoming truly fluent and or bilingual. And the other thing is that the brain actually develops in a way that makes it easier to add a third and a fourth and a fifth language to that child, which is why in European countries you have these kids who can speak seven or eight languages, you know, switching Would back and forth pretty effortlessly. Would that mean more language teachers at the middle school, foreign language teachers at the middle school and high school to absorb the many more students who would be in that flow? It would mean a change, and uh, the program that we're actually contemplating would be uh, a immersion program. It would be one of the classes would start from kindergarten at 100%, whatever the language is, Spanish or French, um, and then there'd be a slow introduction of English, <coughs> and by the time they got to middle school, um, they'd be integrated into the other classes. Okay. Yeah. Um, community is, connections. Yes. And recreation. Yes. Community connections remains in the budget. The yeah, the funding for after school. What does yeah. community connections do? I know what it does. You know yeah. what it does, but a lot of people don't know what it does. So we're actually having a conversation about what we're going to do for our after school provider next year. Community connections has been our provider. They've done they've done a great job. Um, um, you know, their, their funding structure has changed. Um, 
So we are actually going through a process right now of, of uh, submitting proposals for an after-school provider for next year, which may be community connections either in its current or other form. Uh, it may be another provider. It may be a combination of things. Could it be so the recreation department? It could be the recreation department. In fact, the recreation department uh, very well may be one of the, the interested providers. I mean, it seems there's, there should be a synergy. In fact, recreation yeah. is a part of the schools for until yeah. a few years back. Yeah, and the goals for that are to you know, continue the excellent programming we have to really offer you know, quality, uh, both quality care for kids who need it because there are families who need after-school care options, um, but also to offer um, you know, programs to, to kids to, to get them out, to give them quality experience with adults. Might, to might them that outside. be parents helping to subsidize the cost? Um, yeah, parents do subsidize the cost right now, you know, particularly at the elementary level. Um, so, you know, there may be, in fact, there probably will be some sort of cost share with parents. Um, let's talk about the bond last year. Uh, we had a substantial yes. bond, and I know you're proud of the, the progress that's been made and the dinosaur-like equipment on Main Street, or on yes. Union Elementary School's playground that's frozen in the winter. What's the progress? Are we going to have that ready for the next school year, you think? Uh, yes, the, uh, the, the playground is on schedule um, to be completed by you know, the beginning of, of next year. Um, right now they're doing a lot of the renovations. Obviously they've been slowed a little by the snow, but I don't think, I don't think slowed in a way that they didn't plan for. Um, and then we're gonna begin work on the improvements at the the well, what about the school. vestibule at, at Union? I think that's almost done. That is almost done. The, the Would you explain that project and what it entailed? Yeah, that's basically, you know, and there's some other internal projects at UAS that will be done. The vestibule is, is kind of a, um, it's, it's an enclosed uh, glass entrance coming off with, with pre-K especially. Um, you know, with the current situation, there wasn't kind of a safe place for kids to to wait and be able to see their parents without um, standing outside, which in cold weather can be a challenge. And also when you've got three or four years old, you want them contained. How's our kindergarten coming along in terms of enrollment? Um, you know, enrollment's been relatively steady. I know you've got the slides that, you know, several years out, it looks like there will be an enrollment drop. Um, you know, the further out you got an enrollment projections, the you know, the less dependable it is, that's right. based on But it's just first. within, still within a range of 20, 30, 40 on either side. Yes. But that's a success right now, the integration of that, of the kindergarten? It's, uh, been, it's been going on for a while. You mean? Uh, Our preschool. Yes, you know, the preschool has been a success. Um, in terms of the roof on, what is it, the high school? The high school right now, the roof. How's that being. going? <laughs> Uh, it's it's going well. Um, I think it's largely done or partially done, but um, that's moving that's moving forward well. Now we've also got bathrooms, a major project in bathrooms. Yes. Now this leads me to another slide where we're talking about the capital plan, and that's it's a separate vote. Yeah. Would you explain why it's a separate vote and what the thinking was behind the capital plan? So the capital plan has been something we've talked about for a little while. It got started last year, although it was actually included in the, the general budget. Uh, the capital plan is to have a separate plan that would allow the district to um, basically keep up with maintenance. And um, the f unfortunately, you know, we do have aging buildings. Uh, they do require maintenance upkeep. Unfortunately, the way it had been done, and this is, uh, it was basically we kind of get to crisis mode, um, pass a, a big bond to do a bunch of projects, uh, pay that bond down, get to crisis mode again, um, you know, have a big bond to, to deal with a bunch of, of projects and delayed maintenance. The idea with the capital plan is that you know, we'll set aside um, you know, kind of a, a growing amount each year that kind of keeps up with inflation uh, have a set schedule of planned maintenance and make sure that we're keeping on top of our buildings so that way we, we make investments slowly over time, keep up with things rather than having these, these larger uh, but less frequent bonds to, to deal with maintenance. So as the bonds expire, 
we don't have to pay that debt interest and it can go elsewhere into instructional need. Exactly. I mean, the idea of the capital plan is to avoid having to have large bonds for the period, for basically the purpose of building maintenance um, in the future. And that's a separate vote here? That's a separate vote. Um, there's one major increase in this for busing Main Street Middle School kids. Yes. Would you explain <laughs> that as to, I mean, a lot of us who are watching this had kids who walked to Main yeah. Street Middle School and had no problems whatsoever walking to Main Street Middle School or finding their way with their parents driving them. Why are these kids different? Uh, yeah, this, this is actually something we've heard from residents uh, for a while about, particularly residents who live outside of the center of the city. Um, yeah, and we looked at it, we had, uh, we had a committee study it, uh, we did a survey of, of uh, whether there's, there's interest um, or demand for this. Uh, we found pretty high demand from the middle school What is students. pretty high demand? <coughs> uh, we got 220 responses from middle school uh, students. 60% uh, said they definitely would use it another 11% said they would likely use it. Um, and that's only, you know, we've got uh, 360 students. So, um, yeah, there's still 120 some, you know, 100 and some unanswered for. Um, so, so how would this, uh, you want to bus these kids from yeah. around the town to the high school, or to the middle school, I'm sorry. Yep. Is the high school next? If you were to get a petition from parents, would you add buses to take kids to the high school next? Yeah, the, the high school is different. The, there's, there's a few issues with the middle school that I think differentiate it from the high school. One, um, I think there's safety issues that don't necessarily apply at the high school level, oh. especially with fifth grade. Um, you, especially in a winter like we've had, um, I just, and yeah, this is, I think, the conclusion of a lot of people. There are, there are roads and areas in Montpelier uh, I can think of, uh, you know, Town Hill Road, Berlin Street, uh, Elm Street, you know, Terrace Street, where when you've got, you know, big snow banks, sidewalks covered over. But hasn't that been forever in this town? It, that, that's what I'm trying to say, well, is that there are people who went to these schools who are voters and that the same kind of weather conditions were around in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. What makes this so special? Well, for one, that doesn't mean it was, it was safe then. For two, there's a lot of parents who have been, you know, bearing that burden, um, which, is, which is difficult when it's, you know, that's time when, when parents have to get to work, uh, you know, particularly for single parent families that, that don't have other options. I've actually talked to, I've actually talked to parents who switched jobs uh, who live in places because they they needed to get their kids safely to school. I think it's I think it's a basic, and, and I think it goes to equity that, you know, especially you know some of the, those are some of the more affordable areas in town too. Um, getting providing an option to get kids safely to school. Uh, is if, it's not a sexy thing, but I, I think if it's, very few kids avail themselves, if fewer than hundred kids avail themselves of that, then the cost per goes dramatically up. Yeah. If fewer than 100 kids were to avail themselves of that, would the district consider abandoning this effort? I think we would definitely consider other approaches if this approach doesn't seem to work. But I think the, yeah, but the, the things we want to achieve, which is getting kids to school safely, one. Um, equity to providing opportunities for, you know, families that are out the, you know, this is a very walkable district if you're in town. It's not walkable and we've talked, you know, we've talked about it as being a walkable district and I think that's a misnomer. There are places where it's, it's not a practically walkable district. So a lot, making it easier for families to know their kids are going to school safely without having to. Um, this is duplicative of the Green Mountain Transit of the circulator, which goes out on Elm Street, which goes up towards Murray Hill. We've, we've, which, you know. We've talked to GMT. Um, they are not able to provide, right now, to provide the coverage that. Okay, just curious. Have. Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, it's a continued discussion we have, like having integrated city transportation um, makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's not an obvious solution that will work 
you know, next year or maybe the year after. But, you know, again, uh, you know, getting kids to school safely, reducing, you know, our hope is that more kids will take this. And our hope actually is that not just more middle, Main Street middle school kids will take it, but more UES kids will take it. Because what we find right now is that you have a f a families that, you know, as, as soon as that older brother or sister goes from UES to MSMS, their younger brother or sister is not going to wait for the bus if mom or dad is already driving, you know, the right. older brother or sister into town. Um, so we're hoping it actually increases the UES transportation too and starts alleviating some of the traffic congestion in front of particularly the Main Street Middle School. As well as in front of Union in the morning? If we, can, if we can, on School Street? If we can decrease, yeah, if, if we get more UES ridership as kind of a co-benefit, um, yes, we'd, we'd like to discrete, decrease traffic in front of both those schools. One final question on the budget. Yeah. What didn't make the cut? Uh, what was the final cut from the budget that didn't make the final version? Um, yeah, honestly, we there was uh, nothing from the first to last present presentation that was taken out. It was, I think, it was a very, um, you know, the administration really did a good job of, of talking to. Well, two things: they did a very good job of talking to us beforehand about what their needs were, um, and um, forecasting what they wanted to put in and whether there'd be support for that. So there wasn't anything put in that hadn't already been, you know, floated to the board. Uh, so there was no kind of, wait a second, we don't need to take this out. And secondly, it, you know, the, you know, it was a 2.7% overall increase. Um, you know, the, the tax increase because, you know, it would be a two points, if, if numbers hold, it would be a 2.7% tax increase, which is a little higher than we've had in the last few years, but that's, but, you know, as you said, we've actually had larger budget increases, but lower tax increases. Right now, Again, some of the that's number, part of the merger that we're talking about, the, part of the mathematics you do not yeah, want to go through. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's actually largely, um, you know, the, the merger helped with that last year. It's helping a little this year, but it's largely the numbers. Are we going to see a massive movement. inflation when that merger discount or the, the merger incentive disappears? Yeah, we have a very f uh, forward-looking and uh, cautious uh, business manager who's fantastic at his job, who, who is planning expenses to make sure that that does not happen. He, he has forecasted out and he knows exactly how much Good. more and he's, he's ordering things in a way that, that will um, keep things pretty level. Two things on, on the final. One, uh, you can find this budget presentation that you've seen on the yes. screen in its full version, 36 pages of PDF, where? Uh, it is on the, the school's website, mprsvt.org. Um, the school board page? Yeah, the and school board page. I believe the, the meeting of the 2nd of January 2nd. Yes, January 2nd it was presented. It was also presented, well, January 2nd is the most is recent This is the latest version, yeah, the, the latest one that version. you've looked at. Second, if you have questions if, who are watching yes. this, what's next? Yeah, um, so Libby Bone Steele, the superintendent, Grant Geisler, the business manager, and I are going to be doing a um, final presentation, which will probably be in relatively short order, um, on the budget uh, the night of March 4th, which is right before town meeting. Um, Where? It will be at the high school. And it will be broadcast? And it will be broadcast here as well, yes. Live? Yes. So, pretty much that, that wraps it up. Anything else you need, Jim? No, I appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about the budget. Um, and uh, I urge voters to, to go out and, and vote. Um, early voting is available now. Uh, so you can vote anytime between now and town meeting day. Uh, one more I'd like to interject, and that's that in this issue of the bridge, uh, Jim pens an op-ed in defense of his budget. Yes. If you would take a read on that, that's informative as well. Again, thank you for watching. I do want to say that even though there are no contested races and it's seemingly a boring election, get out and vote. Yeah. Uh, it's important to establish that habit. It's also important for your neighbors to get out and vote. I mean, that's the lifeblood of our democracy. Thank you so very much. If you would watch the other presentations, they're well worth watching. Thank you much.